one woman refused to budge from her bus seat in 1955, even though she'd ridden that bus hundreds of times before. Her refusal ignited a revolution that swept Montgomery and America, enlightening minds. Leadership developed in ordinary moments. One man tried thousands of ways to build a light bulb. Failure became so common that he merely claimed he'd found 10,000 ways that didn't work. He saw more failures than successes before he illuminated the world. Creativity flourished in failing moments. We see the miracles from the mundane everywhere, every day. A singular seed drops into the earth and grows into a great forest, eventually. Small things arise to greatness. A simple dinner party changes a block, then a neighborhood, and begins to reshape a city. Simple moments rise into significance. A single word of calling plants purpose into a human heart and the alters the trajectory of a life. Small degrees raise up lofty miracles. Greatness is in each of us, in each heart. It's awakened in the mundane and the ordinary. Greatness reveals itself in the average, in the daily, in the unremarkable. Greatness hides in the simple, not in the profound making itself easy to miss. Until God arises in the insignificant person to make significance happen. We don't find greatness. Greatness finds us and makes glory from common clay. C3 family, hello, hello, and welcome to church. We are so glad that you're here today and so glad for what God is going to do today. Listen, right now, I need you in the chat. Right now, type it. Say, God is going to do something amazing today. Listen, we I believe that you are here on purpose today, that regardless of how you got here, regardless of how you heard about C3 NYC, I believe it's on purpose, and I believe that today you're going to leave this moment feeling encouraged. You're going to leave knowing that God cares about you, that he loves you. And uh, I just want to take a moment to really say thank you to you as a church, to pastors Josh and Georgie for this amazing opportunity that we get to be together today. I absolutely love, love this church. I, I say it all the time to Pastor Josh and some of the team, but if I was not at Transformation Church, I would move tomorrow. You hear what I'm saying? I would move tomorrow to be a part of this house. And I'm saying that because sometimes you're in something and it's your life and it's your experience experience, and it's easy sometimes to take for granted the blessing of the house that God has put you in. But I want to encourage you, man, this is the best house to be a part of. I want to encourage you to, to get involved, to, to be in dinner parties, to give, to serve, because what God could do when you're planted, what God could do when you commit yourself to a house. I heard somebody say it one way, one time, they said, you know what, you can go to the gym and stare at the weights, but until you start lifting something, until you start doing something, it won't have the full effect that it could in your life. In the same way, I'm so glad that you're here and joining on today. And if it's your first time, I want to welcome you. Like if you have not been part of a church experience or maybe you've been hurt by church or maybe you just in the middle of this pressured time and in the injustice and the frustration in our world, maybe you said, you know what, I'm going to give church a chance. I believe today God's going to meet you. You're going to be encouraged today. But for those of you that this is your church home, that you're a part of this house, I need you to jump in. I need you to lean in. I need you to get involved because I'm believing that God is doing something special through C3. NYC and you know me and my wife Pastor Josh mentioned but I'm married to a beautiful girl named Abby we have a, a little chicken named Arlo Phoenix he's one years old and then uh, we have a baby girl that is due in July so pray for me I'm about to get a lot less sleep but uh, we send uh, our love from Tulsa Oklahoma from Transformation Church we absolutely love the church that we're a part of and the family there but um, I'm excited to be here today because I believe that this is a moment in history and it's a moment that God has a line. That's the thing you need to understand. Regardless of what's going on right now, regardless of the pressure, regardless of the tension in our nation, I believe that God is still on the throne. He is still in control. And regardless of what is happening, he has a plan and a purpose for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans that I have for you. And when he said that, he wasn't, he didn't, uh, COVID didn't catch him by surprise. Racial injustice did not catch God by surprise. He is still in control. And so I'm bringing faith today and I am bringing 
encouragement. I, uh, I love any time I get the chance to, to speak here with really family. I feel like that cousin that kind of invites himself over to the party and shows up. And uh, I'm so excited to be here today. But I want you to know that I believe this word um, is on purpose for today. It's not just a random word. This isn't just a word. A recycled sermon that I pulled out. Uh, This is a new and a fresh word for this moment. I prayed over this message. I fasted for this message because I believe that God wants to speak right where you are today. So I need you to lean in. I need you to type, let's go in the chat and buckle up because we're about to go in. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19 is where we're going to be today. It's a story. um, And again, if you're new to this space, if you're new to church, uh, we're going to be talking about a story of two prophets, Elijah and Elisha. So it's going to be a little confusing. You can track with me, just shah and ja. You, you'll be all right. You'll know where we're going. But I'm going to jump into the scripture today, and I'm believing that uh, it's going to be a powerful, powerful day as we gather in church. And I keep saying that because sometimes, you know, you think church is a building. You think church is a brick and mortar. The church is not a building. The church is the spirit of God that is alive in people. So regardless as if you're in your living room right now, if you're with somebody, if you're by yourself, this is the church. And so we're about to have some church in here to today. First um, Kings 19, starting off with verse 19, this is what the amazing word of God says. It says, so Elijah departed from there and he found Elisha. See, there's Jah and Shah. You got to keep them separated for a second. He said, the son of Shaphat, while he was plowing 12 pairs of oxen before him, he went with the 12. Elijah went over to him and threw his mantle on him. He left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, please let me kiss my father and mother goodbye and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back for what have I done to stop you? So Elisha left him and he went back. Then he took then he took a pair of oxen, sacrificed them, boiled their meat with the implements for the oxen and gave the meat to the people. They ate. Then he stood and followed Elijah and served him. Would you take a moment right now, and I want to take a moment and invite God into this service and pray for a second. Lord God, we love you. Holy Spirit, you're so good. Lord, I thank you that you are outside of of any circumstance, Lord God, and you stand above it. So right now, we invite your grace, your peace, and your mercy. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me, Lord God. May I get out of the way so people can hear you. I thank you that you're speaking to individual situations. I thank you that you're speaking to the hearts of people. I thank you that today, people are going to experience your grace, love, and mercy in a new way. It's in the beautiful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Man, 2020. 2020, the year, did you see the memes about the year of vision? I mean, it was just, it was an easy layup joke, but this is 2020, the year of vision. We're going to be able to see clearly. We're going to be able to to know what's happening. And, and, you know, I, I was thinking about it, and I think 2020 has done just that. It has brought sight. It has brought perspective. It has brought insight. It has brought challenge in a way that maybe we didn't um, anticipate, maybe we didn't expect, but I believe it has brought the sight that we really needed as individuals. And this is the tension of following God. Many times God will bring what you need in a way that you did not expect it. And many times, because we get so caught up with the packaging of what we're expecting, we get so caught up with, with what we think it should look like that we miss the purpose because it was packaged in a way that was different. I'm believing that this year was not by accident, that God hasn't bailed on 2020, that he isn't caught off guard. But I believe that he is using the things that the enemy has meant for evil to bring perspective, to bring insight. I saw an article that really kind of challenged me and and honestly had me kind of shook, if I'm being real with you, that it was showing all the crazy things that have happened in 2020. In this article, it listed things that happened just in the first hundred days of this year. I think many of us, no matter where you are right now, you're experiencing the tension and the um, inner turmoil of a year that seems like it just hasn't stopped. That things have just been thrown at us over and over and over again. In in January, there there were fires that were going across Australia. And and, and then also in January, there was the loss of of Kobe Bryant and his daughter and seven others on a helicopter. And then in February, the world got introduced to this thing called COVID-19. And there were so many other tragedies that happened. In February, we, there was the tragic loss of, of Ahmaud Arbery. And then in March, the, the president issued a national emergency for, for every single state to, to start closing things and quarantining and separating. And then in March, also the loss of Breonna Taylor. And then the list went on and on and on. And this was just in the first 100 days. 
And I started looking at everything going on, and I thought, God, what, what is, like, why now? Like, have you asked yourself that? Have you, have you sat in a moment and asked God, like, what's up with, why this year? Like, why this was the year? Because I know some of you, you had your plans, you had your journals out, you had your head clipped on a fit body, and now you shut up in the house eating Doritos, and you don't look like that pic. But I'm just messing with you. Listen, but I think this year it looks different than what we thought. It hasn't gone according to our plan. It hasn't gone according to what we expected. And now we're in the middle of a time of injustice and really a racial revolution and upheaval in response to the murder of George Floyd. And I'm asking God, why, why has all this been thrown, thrown at us all at once? You know, it's not, it's, not just, it's not just the fact that there was a pandemic. It's the fact that it felt like it was just all thrown at once. It's not just the pandemic, it's the fact that in the middle of the pandemic we had to be quarantined and separated and isolated and, and people who struggle with anxiety and worry and depression now had more things that were cast on. It wasn't just the pandemic and the fact that we had to be quarantined, it was the fact that we were, there were family members that we knew that were losing their lives and, and suffering from this sickness and it wasn't just that, it was also thrown on us that there's still racial injustice and, and racism that is still alive in our country and it wasn't just that but it was people were dying and, and not being held accountable for and for what what was done to them it was it was all thrown on us at once have you ever felt like there was just too much thrown at you at once that there was just the pressure was just too much that it was just like I just can't handle any more you know I was thinking about seasons of life where I feel like a lot's been thrown on me and it was actually uh when we found out we were having our little girl my wife, Abby, she, she called me on the phone. I would never forget it. I was in a meeting, and she called me, and I, I immediately texted her. And I said, hey, babe, I'm in the middle of this meeting. Is everything okay? She said, call me right now. I said, oh, goodness, what did I do something? What is happening? I didn't know what was going on. She called me, and she said, Charles, I'm pregnant. And I said, oh, snap. <laughs> we were in this season. Obviously, we had our one-year-old Arlo. He wasn't one yet. But in the time, it honestly, it felt like it was just thrown at me, and I wasn't ready for it. Like, and some of y'all, like, this was not, uh, baby girl is on the way, but we were, not, uh, we were not ready is all I will say. I know that it happened because me and my wife are married, but we were surprised in that. And in that moment, it felt like, okay, God, like, we trust you. We know that this is the timing, and we know we wanted to have more kids. And now I'm more excited than ever before to have a little girl to spoil and to, and to beat up her boyfriends. I'm not going to do that. That's bad. But to, just to take care of and protect. And I'm so excited for this moment. But it felt like it was just thrown at me. And I started thinking back to the birth of our son Arlo. And Arlo, he had a traumatic birth experience. He was moments where he wasn't breathing when he came out. The umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck twice. But the moment when he started crying and I finally heard that sweet cry, you know, in that moment, the title of father was officially placed on me. Before that moment, I didn't know what it meant to be a father. I couldn't experience the real um, love of a father. I didn't really know. I, I had ideas of what it would be. I had ideas of how I would love him and what he would look like and his goofy little laugh and the fact that he would call me dad and instead of dad and all these random things. But in that moment, when the title was placed on me, what was always in me started to come out. You see, what happens in life is sometimes there will be things that are placed on you. And unless they are placed on you, it is impossible for the things that have always been in you to come out. You see, I didn't know it, but there was more in me. I didn't realize it, but there was another level of love. There was another level of grace. There was another level of, of, of fatherhood. There was more in me than I realized. And that's the title of my message today. I came to encourage somebody that in the middle of this pandemic, that in the middle of the racial tension, that in the middle of the hurt, in the middle of the enemy feeling like he's attacking your mind, there is more in you. And I know you don't feel it, but I came to encourage you and as a messenger from God that there is more in you you. Someone needs to type that in the chat right now. There's more in me. I know that they've doubted me, but there's more in me. I know that I've doubted me, but there's more in me. There is more in me. I know there's more in me, and I know there's more in you because there was more in Elisha. Elisha didn't know it, but he was always a prophet. Elisha didn't realize it, but he was always a prophet. We find him in 1 Kings 19, and he is on a regular day. Something you need to realize with the context of the scripture, it said he had 12 pairs of oxen that he was driving, what this would have spoke to is that he was actually a part of an affluent family. 
He was a part. He was not looking for a job. He was not looking for a new calling. He was not looking for something special and brand new. But in a moment, someone walked up to him and really the calling of God walked up to him in the form of Elijah. And Elijah walks up to him and it says Elijah went over to him and threw his mantle on him. Can you get this picture? He's out there working, just sweating, just pushing these oxen and rolling. And he's just chilling. And this guy just walks up. It doesn't say he says anything. He doesn't even say anything. He just walks up to him, throws his coat on him. And it just walks up. If I am Elisha, I'm either about to fight him or I'm just confused. I'm like, what, I don't, what are you doing? What is going on? I didn't ask for this. And I thought about that. Like, Elisha didn't ask for the coat to be thrown on him. He didn't ask for the mantle to be put on him. Just like many of you find yourself in situations that you're saying, I didn't ask for this. Like, I didn't ask for a pandemic. I didn't ask for family members that I love to be sick. I didn't ask for my skin color to be this way. And because it's my skin color that people judge me and there's injustice to my brothers and sisters, I didn't ask to be a part of us. But in a moment where he wasn't asking for it, God called Elisha. And I just realized that how do you respond when it feels like something is thrown on you that you didn't ask for? That's what happened to Elisha. Something was thrown on him. Literally, a mantle was put on him that he did not ask for. I want you to write this thought down. What was thrown on you was not a mistake. It's a mantle. I'm going to say it again. What was thrown on you is not a mistake. It is a mantle. You see, this thing that was put on Elisha, it represented the anointing of God. It represented the power of the prophet Elijah. And it wasn't actually by happenstance. It wasn't just a random moment. But in fact, God had orchestrated and ordained this moment. In scriptures before, God is talking to Elijah and he says, hey, listen, uh, I, I need you to find a replacement. There's somebody that I've anointed that I've called and I want you to go to go allow him to recognize in this moment that he has been called. You see, what seemed odd and random and out of the blue and kind of off to Elisha had been ordained by God. And some of you find yourself in a moment where it doesn't make sense, where you're not understanding what's going on. But can I tell you that it is not a mistake that you're in the family that you're in. It's not a mistake that you feel the conviction to stand up for injustice. It's not a mistake, but it is a mantle. It is a moment that God has put together for you to stand in your spot because there is more in you. There's more in you than you realize. There's more leadership in you than you realize. There's more grace in you than you realize. There is more conviction in you than you realize. There is more ability to communicate on the behalf of others who are suffering in you, then you realize there is more in you and there is more in me. This word mantle, the the original word, it literally means greatness. The word, it, it means when you would look out unto the sea and you would see how vast and how beautiful and how great it was. And literally, I thought about it, that in a moment when he wasn't asking for it, when he wasn't looking for it, greatness was thrown on Elisha. What I believe right now is even though it doesn't look like it, greatness has been thrown on you. Even though you don't feel like it, greatness has been thrown on your family. Even though you don't feel like it as a parent, greatness has been thrown on your children. Greatness. And there is a moment right now, a decision, a mantle that has been placed on you, not by accident, not by happenstance, but because God knew that there is more in you than you realize. And it's because he created you. He created you specifically. He created you with every quirk, with every odd thing, with the bad jokes that you tell, every single piece of it, he knit together. He said, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. There is more in you. You see, in the scripture, I, I, I see that, that, that what is happening is something is starting to awake in Elisha. Something is happening that, that, that is different than what he experienced. And, and what was placed on him, it wasn't an accident, but it was on purpose. This next thought I want you to, to jot down right now, it says, what is on you is bringing out what has always been in you. Think about it. If the mantle of profit is not placed on him. What is, has always been in him does not have the opportunity to come out. Elisha always had miracles in him. 
Elisha always had greatness in him. Elisha always had those things in him. But if God doesn't ordain this moment where something is placed on him, what is in him cannot come out. I didn't realize it, but I always had the father of Arlo on the inside of me. I always had love for him on the inside of me. I always had the ability to comfort him like no one else can on the inside of me. But not until the burden or the pressure or what felt like the weight of fatherhood was placed on me that what was in me could start to come out. I am believing by the power of God that in the middle of this hard time, in the middle of you, of you trying to find your voice and speak up, that the pressure that has been placed on you is bringing out what has always been in you. I feel this thing. Listen, you have been doubting. You have second guessed who you were, but there are things on the inside of you that you do not even realize. And God is awakening those things today. And it's coming out, not in a, in a big moment, not out in front of everybody, but in the middle of a pandemic, there is more in you. There's more in you. I know it. I can feel it. There is more in you. There's actually a mantle on you. Now you would say, Charles, I don't, you, you talk about mantles, you talking about more. I'm just trying to keep my mind straight in the middle of this quarantine. I'm just trying to, to stay focused. I'm just trying to to really keep my head above water. I'm just trying to not be angry when I see people who remind me of those who treat me unfairly. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to keep it together. And you know what? Many times greatness, it doesn't feel like a mantle. It doesn't feel like this big moment where something special happens and the heavens opened up and it was like, greatness is coming down to rest on you right now. But in scripture, I was reading it and it caught me off guard. It says, Elisha went over to him and he threw his mantle. And the Amplified Version, is, it put in parentheses, it says his coat. He threw his coat on him. He threw his coat on him. And I thought, you know what a coat is? A coat is a common opportunity assigned to you. It's a coat. Like this was a very common moment. Like, this was not like a special, like, we're going to align all the things and we're going to invite all your family out and we're going to officially say you are the prop. No, this was a common moment. This was a common opportunity. It was a coat. And literally, there was a coat that was thrown on him, a common opportunity that had been assigned to him. And many times, the greatest moments, the moments where we will change the fabric of history, the moment where racism will stop, the moment where injustice will have to die, the moment where you will break the generational curses that have been in your family, it's not going to look like a great moment. It's going to look like a common opportunity. It's going to look like you're in the middle of the mundane. It's going to look like you're in the middle of something that doesn't seem like this big special moment. It doesn't seem like it's all going to work out. But in the middle of a common moment, God called Elisha. And I believe he's calling you right now. I believe there's a coat that is being put on you. There's a coat every single day when you wake up. There's a common opportunity that has been assigned to you. And in the middle of that common opportunity, I believe there's more greatness. I believe there's more on the inside of you. Think about it. Abraham, the father of faith. It was a common day. And God said, hey, I want you to come outside of your tent and look up into the stars and see that, that, that the stars of the skies, how many descendants you're going to have. It was not a great magical moment. It was a common moment. Think of David. David always had giant killer and king on the inside of him. But it wasn't in a great big moment. It was in a common moment. Can you take some sandwiches to your brothers? It was in a common moment that had been assigned, not to everyone, not to everybody else, but to him. And in a common opportunity assigned to him, the greatness that was always in him came out. I am believing today that the greatness that has been on the inside of you since you were born, the greatness that you have doubted, the greatness that has been a attacked by the enemy is coming out not through crazy moments but through a common opportunity that has been assigned to you that's what it was Elisha had a moment where in a very common situation in a lot of pressure and it was assigned to him it was hey I, this I want to put this on you and when that plate when that coat was placed on him it started bringing things out of him that were always there he just didn't know it. And I believe that in the middle of 2020, 
in the middle of this time where you're trying to figure out what is going on and, and I didn't expect this and why is there so much weight and why do I feel the burden of those who are hurting and why when I, when I get on social media, I continue to see things that, that infuriate me and I'm trying to, to push this thing forward and we're trying to, to bring reform and bring change to a nation and trying to, why, why, why is this happening? Why was it all thrown on at once? It wasn't a mistake. I believe it was put on you. It's, see, the thing is, it's a common opportunity assigned to you. Not to everybody, not to your whole family, but to you. There are things that have been assigned to you. And I believe that when this pressure has been put on you, it's bringing out what has been in you. You see, when the coat is put on, you have a decision to make. Elisha had a decision to make. I want to give you three quick thoughts that I, that I see in his story. The first thing that Elisha did is you have to commit to your coat. He committed to it like he the moment it was placed on him, the common opportunity that had been assigned to him. The moment it was placed on him, it says Elisha left and he went back. He took a pair of oxen. He sacrificed their meat and he gave the meat to the people. He was not playing. He was committed. He said, you know what? I am not going to downplay this moment. I'm not going to downplay the responsibility that has been placed on me, but I am going to commit to this thing. I am so tired of seeing believers who will not commit to the coat that God has put in front of them. They won't sell out to the thing that God has put because of what other people would say, what they would think about me, and that'll mess up my feed because, you know, I got this certain aesthetic. If I post about Jesus, people may think I'm weird. Well, right now, people don't need a post that looks good. They need someone who can save them. And as long as we continue to downplay what God has called us to, as long as you downplay the calling on your life, what's happening is you're giving yourself an excuse to require or less of you but there's more on the inside of you and today I'm believing that something's going to stand up and you're going to stand up in confidence and you're going to commit to the opportunity that has been assigned to you you got to commit to it you got to sell out to it there have been so many moments where I remember I somehow I don't even know how it happened but I got hired as a youth pastor at 19 years old how a 19 year old gonna pastor 18 year old I don't know pastor Josh I wasn't I could tell you that I was trying to pastor myself goodness gracious anyways but I, in that moment I realized that as I continued to grow older in ministry that I had a I had a I had a common opportunity but I had to commit to it and I think there are so many believers who want to commit at a half um, way, but see the full impact and expectation of people that you look up to or people that you see on a stage or a moment. But until you commit to the, not the great moment, the common, if the mantle represents greatness, but the coat is a common opportunity assigned to you. I think right now we're in such a beautiful space where people are speaking up against injustice. People are speaking up. And it, you know what? I had this thought that racism has been prolonged because people did not take ownership of cope moments, common opportunities, common moments where a joke was said, common moments where a, a, a racial slur was said. Common moments where they saw injustice and didn't speak up. Common moments where, where they knew something was wrong, but they thought, you know what, our family's always been this way and it's kind of how the society is. No, but when you commit, when you step up, when you own it, when you say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When you make a decision that I'm going to commit to what God has called me to do, I'm not going to compare it to other people. I'm not going to wonder what they would think about me, but I am going to commit to the calling and the mantle and the greatness that God has placed on me. The second thing I love that Elisha did is, is I, I wrote this down, you have to carry your coat. What's so interesting to me is after the coat is thrown on him, it doesn't immediately become his. Look at the scripture. It says, he gave the meat to the people, they ate, he stood, and he followed Elisha and served him. The NLT says, they all ate, and he went to be an assistant. You see, what you have to do is really in a common opportunity. My question is, did you enter the opportunity with the heart to serve? In the middle of the time where we're experiencing injustice, in the middle of a time where there's tension, where there's pressure, we're in the middle of a pandemic, when the opportunity, when the common moment, and when the greatness has been assigned to you, what's your heart posture? Are you there to serve people? Are you there to push this thing further? Elisha made a decision and he literally enters a season where he serves Elijah. He's not serving his own agenda. He's not serving things that he, that he thinks. He's not serving a good idea he had. He's serving the authority that God has placed in him. And I think it's 
so important that we do not lose the mindset of a servant. Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to be a servant of all. If the creator of the universe, the person who had the most greatness on the inside of him, could lower himself to serve people. Thank you, Holy Spirit. He served people who mistreated him. Think about it. Jesus, and I know this is tension, and I'm about to speak very directly clear to this, but we cannot, um, in the middle of a pressure moment, pass over the life that Jesus lived. Jesus served the people and was hanging on a cross serving people that put him on the cross. You can't do that in your own power. You, you can't see injustice and not flame, fume up with anger unless there's a divine power working on the inside of you. You see, the reason I know there's more in you is because it's not you that's in you. You see, the Bible says the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives on the inside of you. So that means when you see things, you can respond differently. That means that there's something different on the inside of you, that you can stand up and see it, and you can make a difference, and you can speak to it, and you can still serve them in that season. There is more on the inside of you. Somebody put it in the chat again. There's more in me. There's more in my family. There's more in my mind. There's more in my heart. There's more creative ideas that are coming through my business. There's more racial reconciliation that's happening in our country. There's more justice that is coming in our country there is more in me the last decision and moment that Elisha had is he had to pick up his coat in the scripture he serves Elijah serves him for a long season and he says you know what he comes to the end of this moment he says Elijah I want a double portion of your anointing like everything you got I want more like I want a double portion and Elijah says something very interesting he says if you're with me when I'm taken up to heaven, you can have it. Fast forward the story. There's a moment they're walking together and a fire of chariot, a chariot of fire comes down and it splits right between the middle of them. And in this moment, Elijah's swept up into heaven and after the dust settles and it kind of chills out, the coat that was placed on him and then he carried is lying in front of him. You know, it's a decision to make. Will I pick up my coat? Will I pick up this opportunity that has been placed in front of me? Will I take up the responsibility that has been assigned, not to everyone, but to me? And I believe you have a decision to make today. That there's a moment. There's something that's been placed on the inside of you. There's a mantle that has been placed on your life. And you have a decision today. Are you going to pick it up? Are you going to pick up the responsibility to speak up for people who can't speak up for themselves? Are you going to take up the responsibility and pick up the mantle and pick up the coat, pick up the greatness to pick up the things that have been placed on the inside of you? The last thought I have, what is on you is bringing out what is in you. This is the part right here. So God can do something through you. What you need to realize today is that the reason it's been placed on you it's because someone needs what's in you. I'm going to say it again. The reason it's been placed on you is because there's someone who needs what's in you. You know, I was thinking of the story of Jesus and this scripture and really this coat, it applies to his life. You want to talk about common. You know what was common? It was actually very common for people to be crucified. Jesus wasn't the first person to die on a cross. It was a common moment. And I realized that there are cope moments. There are common opportunities that have been assigned to each one of us. Moments of greatness, moments that could change the fabric of history, moments that could change how your children are raised, moments that could change the fabric of a nation. And they're disguised as common. You know, Jesus, he's, as he's being prepared and led to the cross, there was something that was placed on him. It was a crown of thorns. And when the crown of thorns was placed on Jesus, what was in Jesus started to come out. You see, 
the way the, the gospel works is that we are separated from God because of our sin, because of our error, because of our wrong. There's no doubt you can tell that there is something not okay with humanity. When we lash out the evil and the rage that is so clear to see in this time, the Bible refers to that as sin. And sin has separated us from God. But you see, God knew that something had to be placed on Jesus because there were people 2,000 years later that would need what was in Jesus. They would need pure blood that would flow so cleanly and it would purify hearts and it would start fires and it would transform people, the, the inside of people and it would burn away the things that weren't like God and it would start to start something that would really change the fabric of the nation. You see, Jesus knew that there was something that had to be placed on him because you and me needed what was in it. I want to encourage you today that there's someone that needs what's on the inside of you. They need you to speak up. They need you to have that awkward conversation that would make you feel uncomfortable but would actually bring change. There's someone who needs you to raise those kids. There's someone who needs you to start that business. There's someone who needs you to say, you know what, I'm actually, I'm not going to stay in that relationship because I know it makes me feel good, but it's not good for the greatness on the inside of me. I came to encourage you today that there's more in you. That there's more than you realize. There's more in you. There's more in me. There's more in our nation. There's more in this movement. There's more. And today I want to challenge you to not downplay for another day the coat that has been placed on you. The greatness that is on the inside of you. Not another day will we downplay. Not another day will we second guess. But we will realize that just as Esther in Scripture was spoken to, the scripture, it says, perhaps maybe you were born for just this moment, for such a time as this. I'm believing that there's more in you and you have been built for this moment. The church was built for this moment. I believe that, that C3 NYC was built for this moment. I'm believing that your family was built for this moment. I'm believing that your kids are built for this moment. I'm believing that today as we take ownership of what God has placed on the inside of us, that we will see what is in us come out and there will be something that starts in our nation, but it would start really on the inside of us that would change things forever. Right now, wherever you are, would you take a moment to just pray with me? Would you bow your heads? I want to pray for every single person who is listening to this right now that you would not another day doubt. You would not another day worry or be afraid or, or be worried to step into what God has called you to. You don't have to doubt it. You don't have to question it. But today, I'm believing that there is greatness that you are stepping into in the middle of the pressure, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of injustice. What has been placed on you is bringing out what God put on the inside of you. Right now, God, I thank you for every single person who is watching. Lord God, I thank you for every single person, Lord God, that is under the sound of my voice, Lord Jesus, that right now they were stepping into a moment, Lord God, where literally they are recognizing the greatness that has been placed on them. They're recognizing the beauty that has been placed on them. They're recognizing, Lord God, the anointing that is unique, that's not like anyone else, that's not like their father, that's not like their mother, that's not like their brother, that's not like their sister, that's not like their uncle, that's not like their group of friends, but it's a common opportunity that has been assigned to them. And I I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are empowering people to understand that there is more on the inside of them because you are on the inside of them. I thank you, Lord God, that as believers and as the church, we would stand up. We wouldn't step back, Lord God, but we would stand up and we would fight. We would fight for people who can't fight for themselves. We wouldn't, we wouldn't grow weary. Galatians 6, 9, we wouldn't grow weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we would reap a harvest of blessing if we do not lose heart. Lord, I speak blessing over every single person. I speak favor, Lord God, in the middle 
middle of a pandemic, I thank you, Lord God. Your word says they are like trees planted by living waters and they bear fruit in every season. I thank you that we can bear fruit, Lord God, in every season. In racial tension, we can bear fruit. In, Lord, injustice, we can bear fruit. Lord, in a pandemic, we can bear fruit. I thank you, Lord God, that there is more in us. So we stay in an attitude of prayer right now. There are some of you that the reason you are here in this moment is because you realized, if you're honest with yourself, that it doesn't feel like there's anything left on the inside of you. Maybe you've been fighting, maybe you've been dealing with this time in our nation and you just feel empty. You feel like, I, I, I've, I've tried everything, I've, I've went to the protest, I've, I've spoke up, I've had conversations, but I just don't know if there's hope. The reason that I can have hope in this moment is not because of any outward circumstance. If you are looking at the canvas and the picture of our nation and our world right now, there is nothing that speaks hope. But there is someone who is, stands outside of time. There's someone who stands outside of this moment. There's someone that is greater. There is someone that is so much more than anything you could ever imagine. And I promise you, he loves you so much. And there's some of you right now and you have taken on the weight of the world and you have literally thought there's no hope. Like I can't handle it. I can't do anything. I can't fix the problem. I can't. But I promise you that the, the truth is you can't fix the problem. We can't fix the problem. We can't do it by ourselves. But there is a Savior and his name is Jesus. And he loves you. He has always been in love with you. He is proud of you. Regardless of what has happened, regardless of what you've heard about church and about Jesus, he is madly in in love with you and all he wants is a relationship with you all he wants is to say listen I just I know that there's hurt I know that there's pain but you see when when you invite me in the Bible says he stands at the door and he knocks he just says hey I, I want to come in like I want to help you I want to bring you peace that surpasses understanding I want to bring you I want to bring you contentment in your season I want you bring you the, the voice to speak up I want to bring it to you all you got to do is surrender listen there are some of you right now that the reason you're here and today you're going to accept Jesus into your life listen you don't have to clean up you don't have to I got to get my life together first and then I could come no you don't go to a hospital because you're fixed you go to a hospital because you're broken and you need the help of someone else to bring healing in your life Jesus stands ready and he is the great physician to heal every wound every hurt every pain everything that you have fought in this moment he is entering into your life right now if you would like to accept Jesus into your life I want you to repeat this prayer after me everybody watching repeat it together say dear Heavenly Father thank you for loving me dear Jesus I admit I've made mistakes Lord save me Lord change me Lord transform me Lord make me new to the name of Jesus I pray Amen.